Welcome, everyone. We are very excited for this webinar today. We're, we're going to have some of our great new partners from Fork Farms here. Uh, my name is Amy George. I've been with Rova Odd for uh, just about four years now, uh, primarily working in the K-12 space uh, with schools in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, we've launched several projects uh, in the in the last four years, including multiple uh, AI jobs, esports, um, you know, different STEM cart solutions. Uh, really uh, focusing on what we can do to help schools and and what your needs are, and aligning with that. Uh, Robot Lab in a nutshell. <laughs> We're founded in 2011. Our headquarters uh, are in uh, Texas, but we also have several locations now around the U.S. and in Colombia. Uh, Bogota, Colombia. Uh, we've recently launched franchising as well, which makes us available in multiple states uh, to serve our customers. Uh, we are present in multiple industries, including hospitality, banking, uh, educational institutions, healthcare, uh, public and government sectors. Uh, we offer consulting, integration, deployment, and repair and support, uh, which is our next slide. So what do we do in a nutshell? <laughs> We basically uh, listen to our customers, find the solution that works best for you. Uh, one size does not fit all. So we want to uh, make sure we do uh, serve the right robot for you uh, and help uh, repair it, uh, support, uh, training, deployment, content creation, you name it, we help with that. Uh, some of our partners throughout the years in awards that we've won uh, and I also want to introduce our special guest, uh, Alex Tying. He's the president of Fork Farms. He has uh, done a multitude of things with this company. And we're excited to also announce Steve Tying as well. He is the president of uh, partner development, sorry for Fork Farms. Uh, we're very excited to uh, introduce them and they're gonna be coming on now. But first we are going to highlight uh, one of the latest CBS segments that they were involved in. Go ahead, Abby. Tonight's Eye in America, we take a look at an innovative method that sets up farms inside schools, just down the hall from the students who need it most. Here's CBS's Roxana Saberi. At Ashwaubenon High School near Green Bay, Wisconsin, past the tater tots and the fried chicken sandwiches, you'll find something much fresher. When you get a bite of the salad, it's just amazing. I eat it every day at school. So fresh. Do you know where it comes from? No idea. It was grown and picked just down the hallway. Fresh food can be grown easily in Wisconsin in the middle of the winter. And there's no soil in sight. This indoor hydroponic garden relies on circulating water, special nutrients, and around-the-clock light from LEDs. We've done tomatoes, beans, sugar snap peas. Adding up to around 850 pounds of produce a month. Nutrition coordinator Caitlin Tariainen says that's enough to feed up to 2,000 students throughout the district. A lot of our kids aren't exposed to fresh foods at home just because it's financially hard for the families to purchase those kind of things. Is this the only place where they're getting fresh vegetables? It may be, absolutely. It sets up in about 45 minutes. The system stemmed from the imagination of Wisconsin native Alex Tyke. <laughs> Trained as an opera singer, he got into rooftop gardening in New York City between gigs. They had squash growing right in the middle of Bushwick, Brooklyn. Then decided to use what he'd learned to start a company called Fork Farms to help people grow their own food. Food is already having to travel further and further to get from seed to plate. Our food system is failing us which is why he sees this 2,500-year-old technique as the water and land-efficient farming of the future. And with nearly one out of every eight American households facing food insecurity, Tank says units like his can get people fresh food faster. It's probably some of the best lettuce I've ever eaten. Mark Gurok got grants to buy two of the $5,000 devices for the food bank he runs near Milwaukee. As the cost of food continue to rise, it becomes more valuable than anything else. If you have the opportunity to have fresh produce on the table versus something canned or processed or nothing at all, how much better is life for you? And that's what we try to do. We try to make life better. 
So did some plants die along the yeah, way? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> a lot? Yes, a lot. In Milwaukee public schools, where school officials say more than 80% of students are economically disadvantaged, 80 flex farms have sprouted. That's where it gets really exciting because now you have a community of people that are focused on doing this together and they're learning from each other. We're happy to share the video afterwards as well. We have a few videos that'll be coming on as we do the webinar. So obviously, um, you know, we'll share those afterwards along with the recording. So uh, without further ado, we're going to introduce Steve and Alex Tank. Let me go ahead and share my screen again and we'll go along through the slides. Go ahead, take it away. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Alex. Uh, really grateful for the time, grateful for uh, Amy and Abby inviting us. Uh, we love Robot Labs. We've had a great experience working with them so far and uh, really excited to share uh, what we've been working on. Uh, if you're wondering, yes, Steve's my dad uh, and we get to work together and it's awesome. Um, there's about 40 people in our company and uh, and we've been kind of doing this together from uh, from the beginning. So it's definitely a definitely a labor of love, definitely a um you know a, a family business and uh um yeah. Yeah, as Alex uh, Alex is the boss. So I have to be nice to him every day now. And then that's changed. But I'm Steve. I'm responsible for partner development, uh working with great people like Robot Labs around the world on uh, food access technology and, and helping people have access to hyper-localized uh, fresh food. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we, we're, we're from uh, Schwabanon. Uh, we're, we're, we're greeting you from, uh, which is just outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we're going to give you a little tour of the farm in just a moment uh, that they featured uh, in June on the CBS World News and certainly answer any questions. But before we do that, we had just uh, some information for you to share how this whole crazy adventure started and uh, where we're headed. So we can go to the next slide here. Uh, perfect. So um, they mentioned this a little bit in the CBS piece, but uh, my, my background is not in horticulture, agriculture. I thought I was going to be a world famous opera singer and uh, that obviously didn't pan out, but I, uh, uh, on the journey, I I got an opportunity to move to New York City um, from the Green Bay area originally, and I thought I was going to be a big city guy. And when I was uh, there, met a group that was growing food on a rooftop, and I just thought it was the coolest thing I had ever heard of, people growing food right in the middle of this dirty, gray, gross city. And um, they invited me to volunteer at it. It was a nonprofit thing, and they uh, all the food that they were growing um, – went uh, to this food pantry that was in the same building as the rooftop farm. And I thought that was just a cool little microcosm ecosystem happening right there in Brooklyn. And um, so I spent a couple days there every week for the summer. And at the end of the summer, they were like, hey, you're a starving artist. It really looks like you could use it. You should take some of this food home and eat it. And uh, um, and I and I did. And my eating habits changed. And it ended up being one of the most impactful experiences of my life. I mean, next to, you know, seeing my kids being born, it truly, it was, it was really transformational. And for me, it was around mental health. I started eating better and I started feeling better. And, um, it really woke me up to this realization that maybe we've been overcomplicating this. If we just give kids the ability to grow food and feed themselves and feed their peers, will they be more engaged in that food? Will they be more likely to eat it? And as a result, will they feel better? And I think um, we've proven now over and over and over again that that is absolutely the case. Um, so what you see behind us is the Ashwabanam farm. It's the same one Steve mentioned was uh, featured in the CBS piece. Um, but this is now one of a hundred that are at this scale. And we're uh, we're working you know, with over uh, a thousand school districts across almost all 50 states and, and 14 countries. So we've been really blessed in that you know, this is this is definitely a solution that we've um, we've been able to help folks really make an impact with. Um, and through this work, I've really realized how deep and intrinsic and systemic the problem is, um, you know, in schools specifically, you know, we're dealing with this as well, where, um, you know, case price for fresh produce and those dark leafy greens uh, have tripled over the last couple of years. And 
Um, you know, part of the free and reduced lunch rate requirements, you know, requires a certain amount of servings of dark, dark leafy vegetables. And um, just to meet those requirements has become a big challenge. And so we view ourselves as being able to really offset those costs and to be able to offset, um, create more flexibility in the food, uh, uh, the, 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 the nutrition services piece, uh, while also adding a lot of value add to the classroom um, and really uh, like Robot Labs does, right? Like really meeting the partner where they're at and whether their need is more on the makerspace side or on the STEM side or on the nutrition services side or multidisciplinary, um, our approach is to really meet people where they're at. Um, so you can go to the next slide. There's a, there's a lot of different um, trends that are uh, impacting uh, uh, this this industry um, it's it's a quickly growing industry and so uh, for career technical education uh, we see a, a huge current opportunity but also large future opportunity in the industry for employment um, so that's been a big focus for ours but also uh, just generally speaking um, uh, food security uh, food insecurity is on the rise so it, uh, you know globally uh, we've got a lot more people coming and where uh, those population increases are expected to be is not where the available farmland is. And so that means that food is going to have to keep traveling further and further to get from seed to plate. And um, and what's happening as a result is that we have to grow more shelf-stable crops in order to be able to get them from seed to plate. And um, that requires the processing of foods. And we now know that processed foods are clinically linked to all sorts of comorbidities related to different chronic diseases like cancer, stroke, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and that's killing people. And life expectancy is, is actually going down for the first time in a long time right now. And we can tie it all back to food. And so what, what our company is trying to do is figure out, is there a way where we can uh, sustainably grow more of these highly perishable crops and get them to market in a way that's uh, economically viable. Um, and and that's that's what we've done. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so it, after I got bit by this bud, bug in Brooklyn, um, I started a uh, by getting some grant funding from the United Way of New York City and built a couple of soil rooftop farms for New York public schools. And that failed miserably because kids aren't around during the summer and they miss all the magic. Here's, an, you, here's an example of that right now. Just so you can see. Yeah. yeah <laughs> like there's, there's nobody here. Nobody uh, here right? <laughs> and, uh, and, um, it ended up, you know, the, the the outdoor school garden, it ended up being relying on a parent volunteer or a really dedicated teacher. And sometimes I can work a little bit, but it's just a real challenge to get it to integrate into the school program. And so I started building off the shelf different products that are were available at the time, still are. And um, that worked a little better, but we ran into this problem that, you know, either the the systems that were out there, they didn't grow enough food to really feed a classroom or to feed the school um, and to make a nutritional impact or they were really difficult to run or they leaked all over the place or um, you know they required a lot of extra energy of a, of a teacher or somebody to take care of the program and so I thought to myself there must be a better way um, and around 2013 I was just tinkering in my apartment and realized that if you put the right kind of light artificial light in the middle of the right kind of reflective surfaces, there's an algorithm to optimize the recapture of the energy. Um, and basically what that did was it, um, is it allowed us to drop the amount of energy required to grow food indoors with no sunlight and no soil by 75% compared to industry average. So right now in the indoor vertical farming industry, it costs um, about, uh, uh, 18 kilowatts to grow a pound of food. Our average customer, what they're doing behind us is 4.6. So 18 compared to 4.6. And when you do the math on that, that really, uh, that really makes it now where you can grow fresh food indoors year round for less than a dollar per pound. And that really changes the game because now this isn't just an educational opportunity. This is an opportunity to really feed people in a significant way. And so our company now is trying to be a catalyst in the democratization of fresh food. We wanna make fresh food available to everybody everywhere. 
And we think we can do that by getting it production closer to where people work, live, and play. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, compared to conventional farming, um, this is zero food miles and zero waste because they're walking it from the farm to the cafeteria. Which, and we're in the um, cafeteria, so it's what, 20 feet maybe? About yeah. 20 feet, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and shelf life for these products when they're taken care of correctly, believe it or not, is four to five weeks. And so it can sit in the cooler for four to five weeks and still be fresh and ready to eat and delicious um, without a bunch of moldy gross stuff, which, which seems crazy because we're so used to going to the grocery store and buying something for top dollar. And we only have three days and it's already, you're picking out gross stuff. But um, that's just because it was harvested weeks prior mm -hmm. and had been handled on average 14 times from when it was harvested to when you actually had it in your fridge. And so the fact that this is handled a lot less, the food safety then is much easier to control and uh, and the shelf life is a lot higher. So we don't have anybody um, throwing product away, which we're really proud of. Uh, compared to conventional farming, it's 45 times more food production per square foot. Um, and so this is where in indoors and in vertical farming, you can really take advantage of, of space and make sure that you're growing a lot of food in a small amount of space. Um, this next one is really important, especially to folks that we talk to in the Southwest uh, region in the, in the country. Um, for every uh, 100 gallons of water that conventional farming uses, we only need to use two gallons to produce the same amount of food. So it's a 50 times more water efficient. And it's simply because it's a recirculating system. You know, when you water the soil, you get one shot and then it's gone. But with this, we reuse it over and over and over again. And our system is uniquely um, uh, efficient in this and that it doesn't allow for a lot of um, evaporation mm -hmm. uh, out of the unit. And, uh, and the next one is really what we're known for. It's, it's the most economical system to run. Um, and that means that the food that comes out of this is going to be really affordable. It means that you can do creative things with food budgets and with those savings, you can deploy those savings to do other things. Um, we've had customers get solar arrays and uh, get new furniture and to buy band uniforms, all sorts of stuff by the, the cost saving offset related to this. Um, not to mention the fact that some schools actually run a commercial farming program where the kids, uh, they grow and sell food, maybe at a farmer's market or to the teachers in the school local and local restaurants, local restaurants. And they'll, they'll use that to, um, you know, either provide a paid internship opportunity with the kids or uh, buy new band uniforms or whatever, whatever the school needs. Um, so we can go to the, the next slide. Um, compared to, uh, you know, other indoor vertical farming systems, uh, this is, these are the metrics that we think matter the most. We think that if our, uh, device pays itself off the fastest and if it kicks out the most affordable food at the same or better quality, we think we win. And right now we're pretty far ahead, um, in, in that regard. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, we've learned along the way though. So we started operating in around 2017, 2016. Um, so we've been at this for, um, for, for a while now. And, and we realized pretty early on that it's not enough to have the most efficient technology. You have to provide wraparound support and tools to enable success. Um, something like this is scary to people who don't know anything about it. You know, it looks like a lot of work. It looks like a lot of hassle. And, um, the last thing they want to do is advocate for a purchase like this within their school and then have it fail. And so a big part of what we do is we help build confidence and we help provide the support and the backbone to the experience to make sure that people have success and have early success. And so that looks a lot of different ways, depending on who we're working with. And a lot like Robot Labs, we take this very um, partnership approach with that. And we've got a dedicated team that works with each installation that we do to make sure that not only is the grow successful, but also that the integration of the program is as um, as deep as we can make it. And so um, we have uh, ex-curriculum directors on staff that'll work with the curriculum program to figure out we have a curriculum and in what ways can we most appropriately plug that in um, so that we're um, killing two birds with one stone for mm -hmm. lack of a better metaphor. And, um, uh, or, you know, working with the FFA chapter or with, uh, you know, the, 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 the maker space area to make sure that the correct integrations are in place so that, um, you know, the right training happens on site, but ultimately that the kids are the ones driving as much as possible. 
Um, and so we offer uh, unlimited free support to all of our partners. Um, so if they've got a question, normally they're not calling like because something's wrong. They call us because they're like, hey, we just had this huge bumper crop of basil. Now the kids want to try something else. Like, can we do strawberries? And we're like, heck yes, you can just throw up with strawberries. Here's the recipe. Um, it's that kind of engagement that we um, that we that we really get excited about. So, um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, we also learned that this has to be modular. It has to be scalable. It has to be easy. And so, um, where a lot of other um, types of technologies that go into schools require a pretty sophisticated installation process. We've worked really hard to reduce those barriers. And so um, our units come, they ship UPS ground, they come in a, a couple boxes and they come together like a Lego kit. The kids can put it together. Uh, no tools are required. Um, it's movable. Um, so if it, if it starts in a STEM classroom, it can go to the culinary room or it can go to the cafeteria uh, really easily. Um, but also we learned that after people start, generally they get excited about expansion pretty quickly. Um, and that's how this farm started. They started with one flex farm mm -hmm. um, and then they said, hey, this is really working for us. Let's do something a little bit more and see if the kids will uh, eat if, it, if it's in our salad bar. And so they got four additional units. Um, so they had five for a while. And then they said, wow, this school is really taken to this. Let's bring this across the district. And now I think they have almost 30 mm -hmm. um, of our flex farm systems across their district. Um, the room behind me is their district level farm. Um, but then they have... I think five or six sprinkled across different classrooms for uh, educational engagement as well. And we can take that all the way up to 60,000 square foot installations. And that's more of an industrial commercial level scale. Um, but we have had uh, schools work at larger scale as well, a bigger district, um, thinking about integrating with a commissary or, um, uh, you know, just, you know, progressive uh, nutrition leaning districts that are, uh, looking to maybe do more than one crop type with something like this. They're not just looking to do lettuce. They want to do all their herbs and maybe some fruits and things like that. So um, the point here is that uh, we've learned that piloting is really valuable and starting small and growing is critical, but the technology has to be able to scale as well. Um, and so we can go to the next slide. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, Alex, too, is that uh, the farms go in any environmentally controlled space. So there isn't any special humidification that's required or dehumidification, plumbing, um, as long as it's uh, heated and air conditioned. Yep. Um, so we have them uh, in offices, chef's offices. We'll have them in um, old storage facilities, wherever that uh, the school or the um, commercial facility has extra space. Again, they're, they're three feet by three feet. We'll show you a picture in just a second. Uh, so it only takes nine square feet of floor space. Yep. And um, to Steve's point, uh, the, the flex farms are designed to work within what's called, you know, regular occupancy, right? And so generally speaking, if, if your, uh, your room is set up to be well conditioned for humans, it'll work with the... Uh, with the growing technology and you won't have to do any sort of like facilities retrofits or running water lines or anything like that. It's meant to be really plug and play in that regard. Um, these are some examples, of some of the partners that we have. So we've leaned really heavily into education as a business, just because we just, we learned early on that you, you gotta be best in the world at one thing first um, before you go too wide. Um, but you know, our mission extends beyond education as well. And so we've had a lot of success in the healthcare space um with uh corporate partners that care about uh environmental sustainability governance um and then a lot of community nonprofits we work uh, have a really integral relationship with feeding america nationally the boys and girls clubs um organizations like that but yeah at this point i would say about three quarters of all of our installations um are in some sort of educational setting uh whether that be k-12 through after school uh universities um we can go to the next slide uh, yeah, we've taken this to uh, almost all 50 states. So if you know anybody in uh, in Montana or uh, oh, Alabama, give us a call. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but otherwise, if you're on, the, if you're Alabama, on the call, yeah, we'll give you a deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so uh, no, but we feel really blessed to have the kind of growth that we've had. I think you know when I started this. 
Um, my original plan was to get a hundred indoor farm placements right in the backyard here. And I told myself if I could do that, man, I could, I could leave this earth feeling like I had done what I wanted to do. Right. I had feeding a hundred, a hundred different schools and providing that level of, uh, of, of nutrition and all that. Like that was, that was the original idea. And it just, uh, it didn't go that way. It just ended up being, um, uh, something more scalable than that. So uh, we have this really cool project that we've done in the Caribbean um, and we can send you a link later, but um, to, to the, to the uh, news article about it. But uh, the problem in the Caribbean is actually similar to uh, many places in the United States. They, they have to ship in all the food that they eat and the costs are, uh, are incredible. And so we got some funding from the uh, United Nations and Sony music group of all uh, collaborators uh, to build many farms across Barbados, Anguilla, and the Cayman Islands. And right now, roughly 15% of all Sally Green consumption in uh, in the country of Anguilla is actually produced on island now using our technology. And uh, they want to get it to 100% over the next uh, three to five years. So it's projects like that that really inspire us and, and make us excited because we're making that island more resilient. Um, and also saving them a lot of money on their costs. And when you go on vacation, your salad won't be fifty dollars. We're gonna yeah. get the price down for you. <laughs> yeah. um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is how it works. So uh, you would um, get access to one of our technologies. So we'll go through that in a second. Um, uh, and then along with that, you get free access to our. A digital platform which is called Farmative. It's a mobile app. You can download it on any of the Apple or Google uh, app stores, um, or you can get it through your desktop as well. But what Farmative is, is basically uh, an incredible resource. It's a learning management system. It's a community. Um, it's a way to connect back to our team. And, uh, and in it is just a wealth of resources. So depending on what your use case is and the way that you'd like to use this, whether that be um, you know, more educationally leaning, more food service leaning or anything in between the tools in there to enable that are in there. So there's a, a 44 lesson plan K through 12 curriculum that's next generation science standard aligned. There's a badging program. There's short form activities for an after school program. There's coloring books. I mean, it's just there's all the food safety and handling information for commercial operations. There's performers for commercial growth. I mean, there's just such a wealth um, and we're CT. CTE, yeah, we're building on it all the time. And so um, this is really where so much of the value is. Um, we also offer the supplies. So if you're like, hey, where, do, where am I going to get seeds and things like that? Uh, we offer that, but you don't have to get it through us. And I think that's something that we do that others don't do. And, and the reason for that is we really believe in seed sovereignty. We think that if you've got an old heirloom tomato variety that your grandma gave you, like we should not be deciding that you can't use that. And so um, you you can get everything you need to run uh, our technology at a local hardware store, but um, we make it really convenient. Uh, and we also offer it at a better price to, uh, typically. And so, um, you know, so that's something that we offer. And then I mentioned the free support as well. Uh, we can keep going. Um, so this is, uh, uh, kind of the high level on the flex farm. Um, there's 288 planting spaces in it. Um, so it can grow uh, upwards of 30 plus pounds of uh, salad greens every 28 days. Um, it, it grows a lot more than that, though. We have a lot of success with all the culinary herbs um, and uh, as well as strawberries, cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, fruiting plants. For a lot of fruiting plants, so we've had schools experiment as well with with a lot and things that we never thought were possible. We've learned are, is possible. We had a a school in Connecticut do apple tree starts last year. We had a school in Nevada do a pumpkin growing contest. Perennials, perennial starts like uh, like native plants. You, you started uh, what in yours? Uh, milkweed, milkweed and and, and, and coneflower. Flowers. Yeah. Um, at my house right now, we're doing a lot of edible flowers. Um, so squash flowers and, uh, um, and pansies and, and things like that. Um, and so there's just a ton of options. Um, and, uh, and this, uh, this energy efficiency is really what, what makes it sustainable over time. Uh, we can keep going. Um, this seems like kind of a silly thing to put on a slide. Um, but oh, something got messed up with the formatting there, but, uh, uh, but uh, nobody likes cleaning. 
And uh, the first versions of our technology, this is the fourth generation of it. Um, the first couple generations were really hard to clean and it really drove everybody crazy. And so we we fixed that with the fourth generation. And now the plants actually grow in a, in a panel. And when we go into the farm, we can show you one. Um, but these slide out, they're, excuse me, they're the size of a dinner plate and they go into any commercial or residential dishwasher and that's how you clean it. And so it really brought something really painful and annoying to a really simple automated process. Um, we make everything uh, here in the state of Wisconsin. We've got a pretty rich uh, manufacturing ecosystem here and it's part of our ethos, right? We're a local food company. We want to take care of our local manufacturers and suppliers. Um, and then we also have uh, another uh, option for folks that are starting to scale. Um, and we'll again show you this when we get into the farm, but it's called our Flex Connect system. And what that is, is a daisy chain system that actually connects these flex farms together. And so when you get to four or more flex farms, you can actually put them on a unified irrigation system. And what that means is that instead of having to take care of, let's say 12 individual flex farms, you only have to take care of one of them. And then this flex connect system will bring all that uh, adjustment that you've made to the water across all of the units. And that saves a ton of time and it makes, uh, it makes the technology that much more modular. Just want to add, so the tanks are connected, um, and that's the open position. The closed position is around the light. Um, the, each farm takes somewhere between 25 and 28 gallons of water. Um, the maintenance on it is real simple. Just make sure it doesn't run out of water. Adjust the pH. Typically, uh, municipal water systems are high in pH, so you just need to adjust it down a little bit and then add the nutrients. And we provide uh, three to four months of all the supplies you need to get started along with the seeds. Um, and as Alex mentioned, you can get the supplies anywhere or you can certainly get them through Farmative as well, but we wanted to make it easier for people. And the interesting thing is we're seeing schools, as Alex mentioned earlier, it's on wheels. It travels really easily. There's only two plugs, one for the light, that's LED, uh, and one for a, a little small pump in the base of the tank. Um, you just unplug it and you can wheel it between classrooms, you can wheel it, down to the cafeteria. Um, the average size school in Wisconsin is 100 elementary schools, 150 kids, mm -hmm. and one flex farm, and the capacity of uh, you know 30 pounds of food every three and a half weeks or so will take care of all their fresh food needs that they have. So for, for leafy greens, for leafy greens, yep. thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they won't have to uh, purchase leafy greens again from a wholesale side uh, with one flex farm. Um, well, only other thing to add to that is if you're wondering, we, that weekly maintenance you mentioned, it takes at a minimum about 15 minutes every week. Um, we recommend checking it a couple times a week. And so expect more like a half hour to 40 minutes weekly. Um, the kids do all the work ideally. Um, but it's critical to have one, what we call farm manager on site. And so that could be a teacher. It could be the curriculum director. It could be a administrator, but some adults who, has taken up the mantle to to uh, more deeply understand FFA, the, the system. FFA teacher, instructor, yeah, somebody like that who yeah. can do the the critical uh, training with the kids and is is really integrating it into their program ideally. Yeah. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a short video. Again, we we can send this out about uh, the Ashwabanan farm here. Um, and uh, Caitlin uh, Torianen, unfortunately, had a, a family emergency today. She really wishes she could be here. But um, if if we want to play it, we can. If not, um, we, we we'll can just, just walk into we, the farm. We can walk into the farm after we're done talking here and, and give you a little tour. All right, welcome, welcome to the Schwabenon Farm. Uh, sorry, buddy, here. Want to say hi? What's your What's your name? Justin. Justin. This is Justin. This is the guy oh. on CBS News. This is the man. Are available oh. Of CBS fame. <laughs> he sells autographs for five bucks. Uh, so back here, you can see uh, this is our Flex Connect system. Really simple, modular. They all kind of plug together. Um, you can see all the beautiful uh, greens growing. They're all in a different harvest cycle so that every week they get a consistent production. Um, but you can see here they're growing, uh, growing some flowers um beautiful edible flowers here um they've got some herbs growing back here so that looks like uh, a butterhead lettuce variety with some parsley and dill 
uh, some basil. Um, so they're uh, they're feeding about, uh, and this comes from Caitlin, about 1,600 to 1,800 students every day with a farm this size. Um, and it's about uh, half of their district's total capacity. And so we've got a, uh, uh, a plan that we're working through with them, collaborating with them to support the fundraising that's required um, to uh, double the size of this farm so that they can um, they can serve 100% of their needs. Uh, you can also see here they're doing some uh, some sweet peppers, some commercial pepper varieties. Um, and that's this entire system here is pretty well decked out with these beautiful uh, peppers. Some of them are about to about to ripen. Um, and so they've got they've got two uh, two whole units here that are dedicated to um, different flowering varieties. Um, also a, a farm, yeah, a farm this size. Uh, we run it like a commercial farm, and so we do all the training on, um, you know, what's the food safety and handling, and what's the um, the maintenance schedule. And we really we put together more of a, a a commercial farming plan for the school to make sure that they can hit the ground running and dedicate the right level of resources to it for it to be successful. Uh, part of that is you you start your seeds in a really simple nursery system. So this is called a sprout stand. Um, and that uh, just a couple times a day, it floods this tray here uh, to water these uh, these seedlings. Um, and this is how the plants start. So they spend a week or two um, in the uh, in the sprout stand before they're transplanted into the flex farm for their final three to four weeks. Um, let's see. The only the only facilities updates that had to be made to the space uh, a farm a smaller farm you don't have to do this, but something a little bigger is that facilities dropped uh, these uh, these electrical lines from the ceiling. Um, that's to make sure that we don't have to use extension cords, things like that. With one or two flex farms, you can use outlets in the wall. Um, but uh, for a farm this size, there's a, but their their internal maintenance team was able to do that work. And then uh, there's no water hookup. And so we just used uh, the water that was already available in the space. Um, Steve is holding a, a grow panel. And so there's 32 of these in every flex farm. So nine times 32 should be 288. I hope that math shakes. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and you can kind of see how they plant uh, sequentially. And so depending on uh, the crop, if it's a really big head of lettuce, like these will turn out to be, you only do three per panel, but for plants that grow more tightly, like basil, you can plant every single hole. And so part of uh, the design here is that modularity has been baked into the design pretty much in every way. Um, and those are the panels that go into a dishwasher, you clean them and uh, it's the component that gets the dirtiest and needs the most amount of cleaning. Um, otherwise what they're doing in here is they're once, uh, well, a couple times a, a week, they're, uh, checking the nutrient level of the, of the water. Um, you want to grab a TDS meter there in the, in the pH. So we ship you, uh, this which uh, you just dip into the water and it'll uh, give you a, a readout on the parts per million of uh, total dissolved solids of the particulate that's in the water. Um, we teach you right from the very beginning what your target level is and then how much uh, nutrient you add, need to add to the water to get it to the correct level. Um, so that happens at least once a week. Um, and then we also ship a really simple pH bottle. This is also integrated into the curriculum. Um, but what this is, is uh, uh, just like if you test a pool for pH, it's a, a simple indicator. You add a couple drops to this uh, from water to uh, make sure the pH is in the right range. Um, Steve mentioned this generally, municipal water comes in on the high side. And so we ship some, uh, what's called pH down. Uh, you add a couple tablespoons of that to get that in the right level. And then uh, you top up the water supply. Um, and that's that's uh, by and large what the weekly maintenance schedule looks like. It's it's that simple. Um, and then during harvest time, um, people do it different ways. If you only have a couple flex farms, you can cut the big leaves off and let the plant regrow. You'll get two or three harvests per plant if you do it that way. Otherwise, in a com more commercial operation like this, we recommend people harvest the entire plant and start fresh because staying on a consistent harvest schedule with this actually reduces a lot of... Um, a lot of maintenance and administrative headaches. So just having a really predictable supply is critical at a farm of this scale. 
Um, this is rock wool. Uh, this comes with the flex farm as well. All this is is a volcanic rock that's been heated up so it expands. Um, so it's inert. It's environmentally safe. Um, but it's what we start our seeds in. So you plant a seed in each one of these holes. You wet you wet the uh, this rock wool. You let the seeds germinate. Once they germinate, um, if you have a smaller operation, you can plant it right in the flex farm then, or a bigger operation like this, it goes into the uh, the sprout stand system, and then uh, and then into the farm for finishing. Um, and uh, Steve also has some fresh products, and so uh, that's an example of something that was just harvested recently. Um, and they, they offer food programming with this district year round. So they have some summer school programming, um, that this integrates with as long as, a, as well as, um, uh, they support, a, a, a food pantry that serves, uh, the local, um, uh, kids. Um, so it, I think that's it. We've got a little dowel. You can use these for trellising. You know, it's, 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 it's really pretty simple. Um, so should we go go back out? Yep. Uh, each one of these uh, light towers uh, takes 240 watts, and then the pump uh, takes 30 watts. Uh, this is on for uh, 14 to 18 hours a day, and when they're on, you can touch them, and it's all UL certified components. And there's also a uh, uh, what's called a GFI, an inline GFI circuit. And so if ever water and electricity were to accidentally meet, it shorts out the system. That does two things. It obviously protects uh, people, most importantly, but it also protects your equipment. Um, and it makes it where we don't uh, necessarily have to um, worry about replacing those parts. Uh, all of our units do come with a one-year unlimited parts warranty. So if anything breaks, everything in the unit is really easy to swap in and out. So if a pump goes out, if one of the lights goes out, uh, no questions asked. We just uh, replace that stuff. Um, and, uh, anything no. I'm missing? No. Yeah. All right. So let me go back to sharing. Oh, go ahead. No, no, As no, please. Yeah, please. We can share. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think everyone's probably just as excited as I am for this and the integration into schools, I think is the most important, but also the ability to do this in other sectors as well. We're talking about healthcare, CTE programs, uh, medical, um, senior living facilities. I mean, what what better can we ask for, right? Um, so I'm going to pull that up now. Yeah. So go ahead. You can continue on. <laughs> Great. Um, so this is uh, just some more information about Farmative, which is the mobile app. Um, in it, there's a community. Uh, that many of our partners engage in periodically, and um, it, it it materializes in all sorts of ways. So we have people share their harvest and celebrate and get feedback from other schools. We have folks share what they've learned. So maybe they tried a unique crop and they want to say, hey, here's the recipe and how we did this. Um, we have partners that will connect with each other across the country. Hey, I'm trying to start. Uh, this type of program, has anybody else ever done that before? And so often, you know, we can answer those questions, but when you learn it from one of your peers and somebody else who's really doing it every day, day in and day out, there's so much value to that. And having a support system that goes even beyond what our team is providing, we've learned is just, it's it's really critical for folks. Um, and fun, fun to be part of a community of people that are all going after a similar thing. Um all the learning resources, this doesn't do it justice, how much is in there. Um, and then obviously the the farmative store makes it really easy to uh, to make sure that you have all the material that you need to keep running the unit. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, here's an example of the curriculum. So we, um, uh, we have a PhD um, on our team who supports this effort, um, Dr. Kim Kalasa. Um, but we also have other partners that we collaborate with as well on this front. So uh, we don't necessarily consider ourselves curriculum experts, although we have some experts in house. Um, but we we uh, we we have a great um, uh, outside group as well that's tried and true. That's this is all, all that they do, um, and uh, and they're all uh, they're all certified um, in in all these areas as well. I also wanted to note, Alex, that. Um... The curriculum or the lessons as you see them are, are complete. So 
you literally can download them. It has the handouts attached to them, the videos work, the PowerPoints. The teacher, the teacher, teacher uh, notes. manual, yeah, the PowerPoint presentations. Yep. It's all pre-built. All the resources yep. are there. So you literally can look at it and then bring it to a classroom and use it. There isn't a lot. We know the teachers are pressed for time um, in addition to running their own personal lives. So uh, we didn't want to you know, comp make it more complex where you had to go find things to make it complete. And uh, we're pretty excited about it because you download it and go. Yeah. So many teachers before we launched this, um, so many teachers were like, hey, we really could use a great curriculum. But so many of the curriculum that comes along with different products, they were like, I just I can't use it. And so it was really important to us that whatever we come out with, it's really usable and plug and play and simple. And, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from teachers across the country that, that they love it and they use it. And it adds value to them because they don't have to spend the time doing the lesson planning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's uh, adds a lot of value. So we can uh, keep going. And yeah, I just also want to add the the power of having the students take control of this too. I think that's really big for schools and giving them kind of ownership over what they're doing. I think that's very cool and, and very insightful. Let's make our students leaders. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and this is such a great opportunity to do that because it's hands-on, it's multidisciplinary. There's a lot of avenues for engagement here. So if a kid's interested in a science aspect of this, great, but maybe they're interested in the culinary aspect. Maybe they're interested in the biology plant science Science's, aspect. Maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe they're interested in um, just serving the kids, or maybe they care deeply about sustainability or food justice. I mean, there's there's a million different ways that we can inspire people to engage here. Um, okay, uh, we don't need to spend a ton of time on this, but I wanted to just make sure everyone's aware that uh, you know, we, as a business, as we've grown, we started with the Flex Farm. That's always been kind of our flagship um, offering. But uh, we didn't know over time if we would get people to say, hey, we need something a little smaller for a home, maybe, or we need something a little bigger for the commercial scale. And what, and and in running, a, you know, a, a small startup, you know, we, we spend a lot of time listening to our partners and listening to the market. And so um, definitely more and more partners were needing larger and larger installations. So we've had a number of different folks come to us and say, hey, you know, like a Schwabenon, we're ready to get to 50, 60 flex farms in terms of production need. And at that point we say, whoa, uh, the flex farm is great up until that point. It's a perfect application for a Schwabenon, but the minute they start, start talking about doubling or tripling uh, this farm, we need to start working with them on a different type of solution because we want to take advantage of square footage efficiency. We want to take advantage of labor efficiencies and things like that and really start to take the commercial farming to the next level. And that's what the flex acre is for. Um, and so it's the same... Uh, engineering uh, components. It's still the panel, the dishwasher panel and things like that. We still drive a lot of energy efficiency by putting these walls right next to each other like bookshelves. Um, but it's a higher vertical, so it's a nine foot tall system. And uh, and it allows you to take uh, that much more advantage um, uh, of, of, of efficiency. So we can go to the next slide. Hey guys, just a little head up. Uh, I just want to let you know it's about 10.51 and we do have a few questions in the Q&A okay. right now. So just want to make sure that, you know, whenever you're ready, just that we can give them a little bit of no, time. No, we, we can get to that now. No, that's great. I mean, the long and short of it is that when you get to the scale, you have to start worrying about environmental controls. And we've productized that as well. And so if somebody says, hey, we want to build a 5,000 square foot indoor farm, we can say, great, we need a... A, uh, an electrical panel of this size and a one inch water line and we can roll the farm in and drop it and we're the only solution in the world that provides that level of modularity at this level of scale um all right so we got... maybe we're just going to look at the questions if that's okay yeah i'm just going to quickly go through these you all can read this uh along with the recording i really appreciate all both of your time i'm super excited about what you're offering and how we can scale and make things more accessible to students of all ages, even adults. Um, and just make sure you follow us on social media. But we want to get to those questions now. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and we're going to let Abby uh, read the questions and we will filter through them. If there's anything associated with cost, uh, just feel free to reach out to me. 
uh, and I'll filter those questions, but go ahead, Abby. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our first question is coming in. It says, how about in a downtown 15 story high rise office building? Can we do it on all the floors? Each floor is 11,000 square. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Paul, Paul, it's a great question. So the flex acre system is for that scale. Um, and so we can provide um, free quotes for uh, like initial quotes. Um, but once we get further into the field, we actually have an engineering team that'll come on site and they'll look at the structural engineering. They'll look at the existing infrastructure in the space because we love leveraging. If there's an HVAC system, let's use it so that we don't have to spend as much money on you know, that, that type of technology. So we try to be really cost efficient that way. Um, but yeah, depending on folks' interests, you know, we have kind of a separate team that does um, does the uh, the engineering um, and, and putting the the package together well, for farms would work too. Yeah, yeah, you can you can start with flex farms in in that sort of space. And we've had you know we're we're doing a installation of roughly that size on the fourth floor of an old manufacturing building right now. We're doing something on the second floor of an office building. Um, so the answer is absolutely. It's just um, we would want to make sure that we do our due diligence, obviously. Before. And you'll notice with that Schwaben and Paul that that we walk through. There was no supplemental dehumidification mm -hmm. or uh, humidification in, in that room. They were it's the existing air handling system. Mm -hmm. And then for an eleven thousand square foot space, we would use like a productized um, uh, environmental control system so that it controls temperature, humidity, lights turning on and off, and that's more driven through uh, like a control system, like a not like a heads up display. Um, cool. Awesome. Um, Nina has asked, how often do you have to care for the farm? She says, I'm thinking about summer breaks in schools and the maintenance during this time. Thanks. So if you guys could give any enlightenment on how they deal with the summer breaks. Yeah, everybody does it different. So Schwabenon keeps them running, but we also have a summer break like hiatus uh, guide. And so if you're going to shut your farm down for the three months during the summer, we've got a, a really simple guide that you follow at the end of the summer where how you um, how you clean your system and prepare it for sitting dormant for three months and then how to fire it back up efficiently when the school starts. So for us, it's, you know, it, it, you know, we don't want people to feel forced to run it during the summer session. A lot of schools don't. Um, and we do a big push every August, September to, uh, to help all the schools get them refired up again and, and support that process. If there's been any turnover maybe, or folks just want a little refresher, you know, we're always happy to, to step in and offer that. How much time is needed to maintain the flex shuttle during the school? Yeah, per flex farm, you know, you're looking at 15 to 30 minutes a week. Um, we recommend checking it twice a week. Um, for a farm like this, uh, they're checking it every day, but they're also running 20, 24, 26 farms in there. And so, um, you know, at, at that scale, they also have the Flex Connect system. And so, you know, they're they're spending probably a half hour a day in this farm doing that total maintenance check because there's some efficiencies of scale that we're able to give them. Um, but uh, yeah, on average, you can expect the kids are going to absolutely have to be on top of it for 30 minutes. But um, some schools, they they create projects around the flex farm where they're going to do some A-B testing and they're going to try different crops. So they're going to come up with a... Uh, you know, maybe a do-it-yourself hydroponic solution to kind of dovetail into um, the work that they're doing on the flex farm. And so lots of schools are are using the curriculum and doing things to actually increase the amount of time that it takes. And so for us, we want to make it really simple and easy, but then additively add all sorts of opportunities to engage beyond that, yeah. if that makes sense. As Alex mentioned, uh, typically schools will take it down in December for the break and bring it back online, you know, when you return in January and then do the same thing in June mm -hmm. and then bring it back at the end of August, early September. You can leave it if you, if you do a really good job setting it, um, you can leave it for a week, maybe two weeks tops without touching it. And you'll, you won't kill your plants. Um, now you won't get like a perfect harvest necessarily, but, um, there is quite a bit of margin of error if, if you have to. That's awesome. And then um, we have just a couple more. So David is asking, what are the challenges of implementing vertical farming in an educational setting? So what are the main issues that you guys have seen experienced? 
Yeah, I think like one of them is that people just don't know that this is a thing yet. And so we spend yeah. a lot of time helping people understand what all the opportunity is and the fact that you can integrate this with food service. You can make an impact on food budgets. You can rethink how you're sourcing some of your food as a school and really think about school nutrition a different way, as well as all the obvious educational opportunities. So I think that's been a big challenge for us is just really spending the time to work with folks to really understand, you know, what the really best use for them is and how we target that and go after that. Um, from there, you know, there's there's always funding considerations. So we do a lot to support schools and um, being able to figure out where are, you know, the different, um, you know, maybe food service equipment fund uh, options or grant options or um, or internal budget um, areas to look at and, and, you know, how this is going to offset costs, but potentially, and, you know, how you can e even use that as a potential funding mechanism. So we've spent a lot of time getting really good at that and, and helping partners navigate um, some of those complexities. But um, other than that, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I think generally people get excited, right? We uh, we're really blessed that I think people generally, they want kids to have access to fresh food and um, we're really passionate about it. And um, everybody needs to eat and everybody has to eat. Right. And so we, so we see this, being something that is uh, in its very beginning stages. Well, I think that gets through um, all of our Q&A, unless there's any last second questions. No, and of course, you know, if you all have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to us. If I can't answer it, I will make sure I loop in Stephen, Alex, uh, but we're so happy that you all joined. Uh, apologies for any video errors, but uh, like I mentioned, we will send the recording after along with any readables and video links uh, so you can enjoy that on your own. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, this was a blast. Thank, Thank you, you for taking the time. Thanks for setting it up, Amy and Abby. We appreciate yep, it. Absolutely. All right. So thank you so much. Feel free to reach out for any questions. Uh, we appreciate your time to look out for more webinars in the future and just reach out if you have any ideas, uh, pricing requests, uh, products that you are interested in, let us know. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.